Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 401. Today, we're talking about whether or not martial arts should be taught for money. And I even brought a guest on to talk about it. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and we're your host on this show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick. And you can see everything that I've been putting my heart and soul into, along with a wonderful team for the last quite a few years now, at whistlekick.com. Com. There's a store there. We sell some stuff and you can save 15% on every single thing we do by using the code PODCAST15. There's a newsletter. You should sign up for that. And we've also got whistlekickmartialartsradio.com where we do show notes and everything else related to this episode. We put out two episodes a week and you can find them all for free all the way back to episode one. Whether or not martial arts should be taught for money, it, it's a controversial question. And I saw that question so controversially addressed in an amazing way on Facebook. I saw some ads offering to teach people how to secure high-paying martial arts students. And the commentary in the comments of those ads was amazing. So what did I do? I dug in, I found the source of the ads, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk to Professor Chris Pizzo and see what he has to say about this subject. Professor Chris, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, Jeremy. How are you, man? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. Good. Well, listeners may be a little surprised because we don't have interviews that air too often on Thursdays. You know, we generally bring someone on. We we talk to them on a Monday. I mean, it's not always recorded on a Monday, but we air it on a Monday. We talk about them, their story, their journey, and no disrespect to you, but we're not here to talk about you today. <laughs> so it's a little bit different. We're here to talk about something that is important to you. So I, I guess in a sense, we're talking about, about you, but indirectly. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give the listeners a little bit of context. I saw some Facebook ads talking about martial arts instructors charging what they're worth and even seeking out high paying clientele. And as I am oft, often to do when I see a Facebook ad pop up that's mildly relevant to me, I'll look at the comments because the comments on Facebook ads are second only to the comments on YouTube for entertainment value. <laughs> <laughs> and if anyone spent much time on YouTube, <laughs> I love you how know you what said that. That's, so, that's, so, that's totally true. And what I saw was about in the, in that first ad that I saw, which goes back probably a couple months now, probably 10 comments, one or two saying, oh, I'm interested in learning more or maybe tagging someone else. And then the rest of them were people that were so outright hateful and questioning why anyone would ever charge to teach martial arts. And so this is probably a good opportunity for you to, to tell us, you know, why why you're putting those ads out there let's 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 start the conversation there sure um so again my name is professor chris pizzo um i have uh, been training martial arts since i was five years old i have several different traditional black belts but over the last uh, decade or so um i've primarily been training and teaching uh, as a second degree black belt in both judo and brazilian jiu-jitsu um, owned a number of schools, including the biggest Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu school in the world, uh, owned the largest martial arts publishing company uh, in the world uh, for decades, sold that off in pieces. Um, and for the last several years, I've uh, really, my mission and my company's mission has become to help other professional level martial arts instructors to make the money that they should be making. Not so, and this is important, right, for us to kind of frame this up. And Jeremy, you and I talked about this already, but, you know, what's interesting is that martial arts instructors, they're not, all they want to do is, is what they've been called to do, which is to help, to mentor, to guide other people through teaching martial arts. Not so they can go out and buy Ferraris and yachts and, and crap they don't need. They just need the freedom to focus because teaching martial arts professionally is one of the hardest, most difficult jobs on the planet. So, you know, advertising for it, this is what's kind of interesting is there are not an overwhelming number of professional martial arts instructors. And so when we advertise, 
we have to be, um, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not really trying. Um, I, I am kind of famous for being polarizing in my ads and previous, <laughs> previous lives, um, uh, in, in this, in this industry, but, um, I'm, we're not really trying to, um, repel anybody with our ads. It just sort of happened. Um, and, uh, in the vice versa to that now is that what we're really trying to do is attract the people in martial arts instructors that need our help the most, because that's what we do is we help professional martial arts instructors, whether they're school owners or former martial or former school owners, um, whether they're head instructors or assistant instructors at somebody else's school, whether they're already doing private lessons or seminars, we help them make 10 to $25,000 or more per month added to their business by attracting, enrolling, and serving, and that's the key word here, high-end affluent clients in both private lessons, small group lessons, and in, in school lessons. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I was just as surprised as you at the, um, you said it best, like the, the, the two exact opposites. You have guys saying, wow, this is, you know, this is, it's about time somebody really uh, uh, helped this industry um, because they realize martial arts instructors realize how, how uh, influential they are to uh, the kids and adults that they teach. And then you have the whole other bunch of crazies, not to really disrespect them, but that just flew off the handle on this. And uh, I mean, the, the, good case, the good thing is that you and I connected, which is, which right. is what was important to have this discussion. Now, listeners, before you think that this is just going to be a, a survey of what Professor Chris and his company offer. That's absolutely not what we're doing. The reason that we're offering this introduction here is so we can give way to a conversation on should martial arts be taught for money? Why, why wouldn't someone teach for money? Why should they? And, and that, that whole discussion is a discussion that we have alluded to in previous episodes. It's never a discussion that we've had directly. And as we get to the end, of course, with, with any, anytime we have a guest on, I will Per, give him the space to talk about what he does, how he does it, and where you can find out more. So, you know, th this conversation should be of interest to everyone, regardless of whether or not you're a school owner. Let's let's start with that pretty fundamental question. You know, why are so many people opposed, even angry, about the idea of martial arts being taught for money? So. You know, we, it, it all starts from the top down, you know, um, what we found with working with professional martial artists for so long now is that the number one thing we have to get them over is that they uh, need to make more money. Um, they all know it inherently. They all want to do it again, not so they can buy things and junk they don't need, but so they have the freedom to focus on their students to get them the best uh, outcome, value, whatever it is. And I, you know, when we looked at the actual audiences and um, interest levels and um, I guess affinity to martial arts, you know, especially online, it, it's so funny when, uh, and, and even on, on those ads, we, we started uh, uh, commenting and questioning people of, hey, listen, you know, sorry that this made you so angry. Where do you train now? And the most hateful comments either ghosted, right? Never replied, which means they don't have an answer for it. Um, or the most common thing is like, oh, well, I trained back when I was, you know, uh, two decades ago or something like that. So what's interesting to me is that active martial artists know that they're getting a bargain. Martial arts professionals, teachers, whether school owners or you know, head instructors or work for somebody else, they know that they're giving a bargain. And it's almost like this unspoken, like you brought up before, Jeremy, it's like this unspoken elephant in the room is that the people getting the value, the students are like, oh my God, you know, I would pay much more for this. And the, the instructors are like, oh my God, I'm struggling financially. I should be charging more. And there's, a, there's, there's almost like a um, misunderstanding in the value transfer between student and teacher. 
And that's a big problem and why I was so excited to talk to you about today because uh, it is, it's just rampant through the industry um, of uh, instructors and, and their, their, their own students having this misunderstanding. When I think about group fitness classes, which is the closest parallel we have to martial arts instruction, right? Because it's, it's typically performed in a group. You, you have an instructor, maybe a few assistant instructors, and they're working with a group of people. One-on-one, you know, we have some corollaries there with, with fitness training and things. But when I think of yoga or some kind of boot camp class or CrossFit, when I think of what people are paying monthly there, even in my area, in, in Vermont, which, you know, our, our economy, things tend to be less expensive here across the board. Martial arts is a quarter, sometimes a sixth of what people are paying for these other pursuits. And that's the crime. Um, not only that, I mean, if you want to look at it from a pure financial kind of uh, aspect, uh, it's what, what's really crazy to me is that how most martial arts instructors, and, and Jeremy, I'm glad you brought up the fitness. I'm going to definitely circle back around to that. But how most martial arts instructors are still charging what, what their teachers charged back in the 70s and 80s. Um, you know, even the inflation right? Shows that martial arts instructors should be at least charging at the minimum 200 a month, right? And if real inflation calculation should be charging around 300 per month. Uh, but then on the fitness side, it's crazy. Yoga is maybe a little different because there are secondary benefits um, uh, to, to, you know, to, to practicing that. But you know, if you want to just weigh martial arts versus fitness, they are literally two completely different animals. Right. Fitness is very, very low value. It just, it just is. It's, it's uh, the, you go and somebody leads you through to get to, to lose weight or to become fit, right? That does happen in martial arts, but think of everything else that happens in martial arts as well, right? All the things we're always talking about. Um, uh, self-confidence, uh, the actual self-defense aspects of it, uh, community, um, uh, everything, even, even going into what we're talking about with yoga, you know, the spiritual connectedness to self and, and, and the higher consciousness and, and what else, all these, there's all these benefits. The martial arts instructor, the fitness instructor just has to show up. And if they are uh, somewhat capable, run people through movements. Martial arts instructor has to deal with all sorts of everything from personal problems, professional problems. They wind up being their student's therapist, their big brother, their father figure. Um, uh, you know, when there's a problem at home, uh, whether they're an adult or a child, they, people do not tell their fitness instructor. They don't tell their CrossFit instructor. They don't even tell their yoga instructor. But every single time, they tell their martial arts instructor. And that's a big responsibility. And the difference between a, I don't even sometimes like to use the word martial arts instructor because it almost even devalues that. I like to use the word martial arts teacher because you are literally teaching somebody something as opposed to a fitness instructor, which is just showing them how to do something. And there's a big value difference in that. And uh, there should be a big pricing difference on that. And yeah, it drives me crazy when. You know, you, you look at um, uh, CrossFit, just a good example. Uh, do people get an outcome and result from CrossFit? Yeah, if they don't hurt themselves, um, then yeah, they, they get pretty buff, right? But that's just one aspect. That's just the body. What about the mind? What about the spirit? Um, and every single martial arts, doesn't matter what style uh, that we're talking about, offers those three things. So martial arts actually has three times the value of fitness because it's 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 helping their students connect their body, their mind, and their spirit. Mm, absolutely, longtime listeners to the show know that I train, I coach CrossFit. It's the closest thing I found to martial arts, and so that's why it's, it's the first place I go when I'm trying to draw a correlation. But you're absolutely right; there is a substantial difference in the way people come up to me, they approach me, speak with me as their CrossFit coach. Versus when I am traveling around teaching martial arts, even if it's people that I know very well through CrossFit, people that I don't know well that I've just met through martial arts. 
they are far more likely to dump what's going on in their lives. Tell me all of their problems, physical, mental, personal, and otherwise. Yeah, it's just the nature of the beast. Um, it, you know, it's uh, think about even for children, right? Um, uh, you know, there's there's all sorts of stuff and beliefs, and everybody has different things about different styles of martial arts. Of you know, which it's all ego crap. You know, which one's better, which one's worse. You know, kids are getting black belts in a couple years. Is that right or is that wrong? But what people don't see, especially for like I was saying with with kids, is that. Again, those kids look up to their martial arts instructor as a, a big brother, as that father figure. And many, many, many martial arts instructors that teach kids are actually the ones that find out what's really going on in that kid's life. If there's something wrong at home, if there's something wrong at school, socially, you know, um, if uh, they're being uh, uh, led down the wrong path by, by a group of friends. And, and that's what parents value um is that kind of uh, connection uh that secondary parenting figure right who is i have four i have four boys and you know i'm close with them but they don't tell me anything but they tell their, <laughs> their jiu-jitsu teachers <laughs> you know everything and then they tell me and as a parent i'm like how the heck was this going on and i'm even on the mat at the same time as those guys you know and they're telling them other things so it's a really a martial arts teacher is such a high caliber professional. It takes so much time. It takes so much dedication. It takes so much, not only blood, sweat, and tears in the actual physical training, but there's a difference between somebody who's just a martial arts practitioner, right? Uh, even if they're a lifelong practitioner, and the martial arts instructor. It's a whole added on separate group of skills, uh, almost like soft skills that, that you would see in uh, the corporate America. So I think we've done a reasonable job of talking about why most martial arts classes are undervalued. The students are underpaying for what they're receiving. Let's, let's talk about the other side of the equation. Why are some people so hellbent on fighting for martial arts being taught for free. I'm not aware of anything else that has this dichotomy. So when I owned and took over uh, the big school um, because it was going bankrupt because of this exact problem, this is the biggest Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu school in the world, um, head of a, the biggest uh, franchise or whatever else, and the CFO begged me to come on and really fix this thing for him. And, you know, I um, uh, have obviously had schools before that and whatnot, but this was the biggest of the biggest. So I had the opportunity to talk to people, uh, people who um, were currently training there, people who had been training there, who had left. Um, and uh, uh, with the pricing models, really test and track not only the what, but also the why that we're talking about. And what's amazing is that if you look back in history, the 1980s and late 1970s really screwed everything up. That's when um, most of us started training. Um, uh, a lot of us had really great instructors, um, uh, really great teachers, really made great martial arts mentors, but because they weren't the best businessmen, they kind of followed the, uh, what was popular at the time. And because in the 70s, 80s, between starting with kind of Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris and then going into Ninja Turtles and the Karate Kid in 1984, right? And then uh, Steven Seagal and Van Damme. And, and there was there's just, it was a good solid 15 years all the way up into the UFC of martial arts being a dominant media. Uh, draw. And uh, the instructors at the time kind of threw the old business model out, which was work hard, uh, not to disrespect anybody, but it used to be work hard and take responsibility of showing people who trusted you, showing them a way of life into transforming that into a wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, um, here is a cool thing to do based on current media. 
let's get you in the door for $99 and a free uniform. Um, and uh, we'll spit you out a black belt in two years. And so because most people today in 2019 have either been through that model at least once, uh, those of us that are instructors, again, like I said, our, our teachers <laughs> um, might have followed that business model because they weren't savvy businessmen, but we were lucky enough to find the guys that took the care and consideration to make sure that we weren't McDojoed out, so to speak. Um, and so, therefore, martial arts has left, honestly, a really bad taste in a large segment of the population, um, meaning that they know that there's something inherently valuable about it. They are still drawn to that mind-body spiritual connection, but because they had either a bad experience or have not had no experience, that they have nothing to weigh it against. Um, and of course, they assume that the reality they witnessed is the uh, uh, reality all over, which obviously is, is, is not true, it's just like anything else. How do you get someone who, you know, they, they've been paying 25 bucks a month? As I, I'm sure there are plenty, I, I know several schools that charge far under $50 a month. How do you? move that school up to a hundred, but let's even just say a hundred dollars a month, which I, I think we're both agreeing is undervalued, but it's a, it's four X. Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. And the reason why it's a good question, I, I'm sure the reason you asked is because once somebody has a perceived value of something and now they are going to be charged more for the same thing. If that perception of value is not changed, then they're out the door, right? This is why school uh, gym consultants who just walk in there, you know, and are like, oh, just raise your prices and, you know, you'll lose 10%, but you'll also gain, you know, 50%, whatever else. That's not really the way it works because that perceived value has not been changed. Um, and so, you know, it works also, Jeremy, if, what if somebody, you know, uh, trained when they were a kid for $99 a month, and now they walk into a school that's charging, you know, 200 or $300 a month, right? Um, you know, what, how do you bring them up that? And the answer is, you have to show them the value. You have to be able to articulate and frame the value of what they're going to learn and how they're going to learn it. And of course, connect that to an outcome that they're really looking for. You talked about your coach, uh, CrossFit coach, right? Most people that come into CrossFit know that the outcome they're going to get is they're going to get in great shape. So they're willing to put up with a very rigorous and difficult <laughs> um, uh, uh, curriculum of instruction right? To, of, uh, to sacrifice blood and bleed and, and sweat, right? To, to get through that. Martial artists, because like I was talking about before, everybody kind of grew up around that 80s McDojo model is it's like a lost art of being able to frame and articulate what you do to somebody to bring their value perception up. Does that make sense? It sure does. And it's something that I've witnessed for, again, long time listeners know, I Prior to Whistlekick, I was in IT and we had an IT consultancy. And over the 11 years, I brought my hourly rate from 25 to about 125. And every time we did it, every time we moved up, it was challenging. It was painful. There were conversations that needed to happen. But what we found was because we were delivering top-notch service that blew everybody else out of the water, people saw the value. They, they saw that they were getting a bargain. And we lost very few clients. And I'm only able to put this in perspective now in hindsight. And part of it is, is from what you're saying. I'm able to digest this in a way that I haven't been able to before. But how do you attack that value, that value proposition that people have already decided is, you know, at, at at the neutral point that they're paying now. So let's go back to CrossFit again, right? Is that um, 
somebody who is in mediocre or not great shape wants to get in shape very, very fast. So they go to CrossFit because they know they're going to get their ass kicked, right? And they're going to, in three months, they're going to be in much better shape than they are. So the outcome of that is visible, right? Is if I do A, I will get B. In martial arts, that is not the case. It is the case if you're able to disseminate and then again, articulate and frame of what you're doing. But, you know, if you go into a martial arts school and they get uh, somebody walks into martial arts school and they're pitched on, hey, listen, at the end of, uh, you know, you sign up every month and you'll be able to, uh, you'll eventually get in shape. You'll eventually be able to defend yourself. Um, you know, you'll eventually, you know, what, whatever the, the benefits are, eventually, is not good enough um, for eventually they are willing to pay fifty, a hundred dollars maybe, right? To give it a try, and then after two or three months, when they're not getting the eventually fast enough, they leave. So the way to change that is to actually ask them: number one, why do they want to learn this? Find out their outcome, and then customize it. A, the curriculum or your service to that person's outcome and give it to them, right? And that's very hard to do when you're charging $25, $50 a month because it's the, the time frame that is required to bring somebody to a transformational outcome is significant. And if the money does not match the freedom of time to really focus on them, then you're being pulled in every different direction. And that's the biggest issue that's going on is that, uh, you know, even um, I bring this up all the time, but uh, anybody, any, any professional martial artist, if you haven't read Jigoro Kano's Mind Over Muscle, that, that's like required reading. And the, re the reason why, it doesn't matter whether you're a judo guy or a grappler or a striker, it doesn't really matter what style. But in it, he talks about the three levels of martial arts. And the reason being, you know, this is written back in the 1880s, right? And the reason being, because that is literally the beginning of the death of the warrior caste. And for martial arts to evolve and to survive and for people to continue to get the benefits, he had to divide martial, him and his colleagues and uh, contemporaries at the time, really uh, divided martial arts into three different value levels. And the first, most least valuable is the actual tactical movements as relates to combat. Because unlike getting in shape, right, where there's that vanity, right, they know that, hey, listen, I do ABC, right, and then I'm eventually going to get to Z, and that Z is going to look like I'm in good shape. Somebody who's selling just self-defense, and listen, I am technically the... <laughs> The most popular. <laughs> I've sold more self-defense videos than anybody on the planet. So it's crazy for, for me to even be saying this now, that self-defense, the, the tactics of self-defense have little to no value. It's not that um, we live in a uh, society where uh, that's much different uh, that, than it was in the, the, the uh, centuries past. Um, I mean, yes, law enforcement is better now and you can't get away with, uh, with, with attacking people, but FBI statistics still show that crime rates and violent attacks get worse and worse every year. But those same statistics also show that if you are in good physical shape, if you are walking with a purpose, if you have some sort of situational awareness, and it, the, if, please, if you have any sort of self-confidence, then criminals or somebody else will not attack you, right? So therefore, if you learn to martial arts, then you are not going to be attacked. It's just, it's the statistics. Therefore, the inherent value of what everybody is promoting, come to my school, learn self-defense, learn how to, you know, defend yourself in the street. Well, they're not really worried about that because um, it doesn't really happen anymore to those types of people. The, the, is that making sense? It is. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the second level is really where martial arts instructors kind of live, and, and, and that's experiential, right? Is uh, whether they're school owners or they're running seminars or um, uh, doing private lessons, is they're teaching those level one tactical 
uh, movements. And listen, you have to do it, right? You have to teach those, but they're teaching that in a completely removed uh, experience and environment than what most people are normal. Most people have to go to work and uh, they're not happy with their job or it's okay. It's just, you know, they accept that they have to do this. But then afterwards, they get to go somewhere where they step through and they're, whether it's in a, they step into a cage or they step into feudal Japan or they step into a, a, a Chinese monastery, right? And I'm not even talking about the decor of a school. I'm talking about that experience that's delivered. Um, that literally removes them out of their humdrum kind of boring life and into something that feels really, really good. And now that they are practicing something that is meaningful in that experience, right, that brings a lot of value. And that's why school owners can and should be charging at least $150 to $250, $300 a month because you are doing a great service of helping people refocus on something that they enjoy, that's purposeful, and that they feel is moving them forward in life. And that obviously transfers over to everything else. Uh, the third level and where what we do as a company and to, to bring martial, professional martial artists is that transformational, where you actually take absolute responsibility for uh, somebody's transformation into their, the highest level of self they want to get. It's almost like uh, you know somebody, uh, one of my private lesson programs that was out here in California, Warrior Fit, is I specifically helped overstressed, overworked uh, anxiety ridden executives and small business owners to get off of that anti anxiety medicine, right? I am not a doctor, all right? Um, so, you know, I cannot tell them to get off of it, but there is an actual protocol using martial arts, right, to help them reduce everything from uh, the uh, surrounding symptoms, um, uh, weight loss, obviously, uh, blood pressure. Um, uh, emotional control, which is really as martial arts instructors, what we teach. Um, and then obviously that refocus of that experience. But when you take responsibility and put it into a actual curriculum, what happens for most martial arts instructors and every martial arts instructor right now that's listening is nodding their head because they know they have transformed people's lives, whether it's that kids who have trained at their schools have gotten into better colleges or have gotten better grades whether it's adults who are, you know, on the, on the verge of uh, uh, everything from having a heart attack or committing suicide or depression, right, are now um, uh, emotionally stable, physically healthy, um, uh, and happy individuals. So all of us as martial arts teachers have done this before, but when you take that responsibility and you partition out the actual transformation that somebody wants now you're talking about that's how you charge maximum dollars, make maximum and make maximum impact in your students' lives. Mm. And that's that third level of martial arts. And I, I think you're right. I think most people listening right now are nodding along saying, yeah, whether they are a student or they are a teacher, they're seeing that that exchange, that change in people's lives. Maybe it hasn't happened for them personally yet. But I suspect at some point it will, because I can't say that I've ever talked to someone who's trained for a while, however you choose to define that, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years, that hasn't been impacted. And if you listen to the episodes of Martial Arts Radio, you hear that every single episode, people talking about how their lives were transformed, whether it's something as simple as, you know, I got off drugs or I, I didn't hang with the wrong crowd, you know, something not easy, but just something simple to comprehend to the interview that uh, one that I did earlier today with someone who was in a car accident of the caliber that they should have died. And the doctors credited their health and their mental and emotional strength from their training with saving their lives. It's so funny that you brought that up. Um, one of um, our, uh, my current clients that uh, uh, is what we're working with is, is a school owner. Um, and um, he, uh, we're, we're trying to, the first thing we, we, we do with, with professional martial arts is try to find where this value transformation has taken place in their own life so they can start on that path to helping other people do that. 
And so I was asking uh, this one instructor, I was like, okay, cool. So, you know, based on looking at the assignments that, that he has done for me and I have all his information, I said, all right, let's talk about your value as an instructor. What can you really do? What, what? And he's like, well, I can help people defend themselves against any attack. And I said, all right, cool, man. Do you, do you live in a high crime area where that's important? And he's like, he started laughing and he's like, no, actually, I live in one of the safest towns in the entire United States. I was like, okay, well, now you can see why you're having so much trouble getting students because there's no valuation of what you say you can. And it turns out, though, is that he was in a head-on car collision and uh, what should have killed him, in fact, wound up with like six weeks of uh, physical therapy um, and uh, uh, in like a crutch or two. And because of his martial arts training, he actually created his own better physical therapy regimen that the, even the physical therapists were like, oh my God, what did you do? And he's like, well, I just went and trained whatever else. And that's the type of transformation that we're helping him put into a high value program for other people that are having mobility issues, whether it's through accident or sickness or, or, or whatever else, or even lifelong um, uh, handicap of how to bring mobility back to their lives in an enjoyable manner, right? Because physical therapy is sometimes not enjoyable. Sometimes it takes a long time. Martial arts has the power to do this. It, it literally, I joke all the time with this as well, is like, you know, between all the people on antidepressants, between all the people on opioids, between all the weight gain and sedentary lifestyle and video game addiction and you know, social media addiction and whatever else, martial arts instructors know and teachers know how to solve every major problem in modern society. It's just that modern society has forgot that martial arts is the way to do that. And so when you flip the script on a martial arts instructor and show them that, hey, listen, you really do have the power to help people even more than you are now, right? It's like a big aha moment to them. And then of course, you know, when you match the transformation with the money of what that transformation is worth, now you now literally magic happens. Uh, the martial arts instructor gets paid, the student shows up highly committed, um, and uh, to transform, and because the martial arts instructor has been paid such high uh, rates and high value, is that they can commit as much as needed to that student to bring them. And that's the way it works. And, and so funny is that this, this happens just normally for martial arts instructors and school owners. They're just not having, they, they just haven't isolated it or uh, broken it apart to really, again, frame and articulate it so people understand the value that they are getting. And that's really what's most important. There's an element of a normalcy bias. If you've been training for a long time, if you've seen dozens or hundreds of life transformations from martial arts, you can forget how powerful that is and how valuable that is. You know, I'm, I'm 45 now and it's not like, yeah, I've been training since I was five, since I was five, like I mentioned, but I was not, my, my, let's put it this way. My kids um, at uh, my two older guys at 13 and 15 um, are better athletes than I ever was. Um, and the reason being that my 15 year old is the starting linebacker on the, the football team is, and the coaches are like, Oh my God, because of his jujitsu and his martial arts training. Um, is, he has no hesitation when he crashes through the line. He's a, a straight A student because he has that discipline as focus. And it's like, you know, everybody, every parent asks me, they're like, man, you know, your kid's so nice. You know, he's such a good athlete. This so well in school. What's your secret? The secret is martial arts, right? There is no secret. The secret is something that you've known about, but you thought it was something that it wasn't because your marsh, poor struggling martial arts instructor teacher was never instructed on how to articulate and frame the value he was really giving you. And when I tell that to parents, they're like, oh my God, I wish I paid that guy more, you know? Um, so, or stuck with it. And that, that's really the, the, the connection that professional martial artists need to make. Awesome. Before we give everybody websites and social media and all that stuff, there's something that when we have an episode like this, I, I think it's important to remind people. And that is that this is not a pay to play podcast. You have not paid me. There is no exchange going on here other than I reached out to you because I saw what you were doing. I thought it was valuable. And I thought there was an interesting conversation in it. 
There are podcasts these days where the guests pay for the access to the audience. We have never done that. We will never do that. It's, it's not the way I want to run this business. The things that, that make us money are secondary to the information. We give away the information for free. And my plan is that we will always do that. And I just, I, 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 want, I want you to, to confirm that, that, that you have not, right? You well, yeah. Well, you what, me a check. It's interesting that you bring that up, right? Is because, um, and one of the reasons I, I really was excited to come on and talk to you is because we talked about what we, uh, about doing this, about the format is I did not want to come on and pimp my business or anything like that. Because honestly, anybody can find us now. Everybody in the world knows that our martial arts instructors are doing six and seven figures, right? It's not hard to find us. But the, the bigger conversation of this money issue that instructors in the general public have that you brought up, Jeremy, which was your idea to talk about, was really meaningful to me because that is the mission of our company. So, you know, um, just I think it's highly valuable that you are doing these honest types of uh, podcasts and uh, even your, your attitude towards this industry is, is I found it well, well received and I, and I, I, I couldn't wait to talk to you as well. So yeah, th thanks for bringing that up. Well, thank you. Thank you. I believe strongly, and I've said this many times on the show, there is nothing that will change a person's life with six months like martial arts will. No kid reflects back on six months of after school soccer or basketball or boy scouts in their thirties, forties, sixties, and says, you know, that was really impactful. I want to make sure my kids, my grandkids do that. Martial arts does that. And that's why the mission here at Whistlekick is really to spread, to grow, to retain people in the martial arts, because I believe martial arts makes better people. And it's the, the best chance I have of having a strong impact on the world. So that's why I do what I do. Jeremy, can I, can I bring up one topic um, about the uh, giving back with martial arts? Yeah, uh, absolutely. You don't mind? So, you know, one of the things, and, and even going back to the comments of why people believe it can, can be or should be free or, or whatever that, a lot of martial artists, again, like I said, no martial artist we talk to is looking for Ferraris and yachts. They're looking for freedom. They're looking to, and they're not looking for freedom to get out of something, right? They're not looking, because trust me, what we do is hard work. Um, they're looking for the freedom to get into something the freedom to totally commit to their students as long as those students commit back to them, right? That's really what they're looking for. And so, but there is always the argument, what about people who cannot afford it, right? Who cannot afford $500 an hour for private lessons like we help guys get, who not, cannot afford 300 to 500 to one of our guys is charging $897 for monthly lessons, right? In small groups. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what about the people that can't afford it? Well, listen, number one is you, can never, as a martial arts instructor, this is specifically for them and professionals, as a martial arts professional, you can never, ever get poor enough to help the poor. It just doesn't work like that. If you want to make it matter, you first have to make it. And so what happens is with a lot of our guys that we work with is they really are looking for impact first, income second. And so because they know that, listen, if they can have the impact and make the income, then they can have a wider impact. So we've had guys that have restructured their schools, uh, who have restructured the way that they uh, transform people's lives and transform their own income, and then open up basically free community center karate and, and uh, taekwondo and, and even judo um, uh, to, to give back to the community in areas that you know, they're not attracting the high end. And even though they give more attention maybe to the most committed, um, to the people that are paying a little more, they are still providing a valuable service. And on that note, actually, that I brought it up, it's amazing. People complain about paying martial arts instructors, but yet they have money to go to the bar on Thursday night and Friday night. Yet they have money to drive, you know, cars that, um, you know, are beyond their earning ability, um, uh, you know, to get rims on the cars to, you know, they, they go to Starbucks every single day. Um, so they, people have money for what they want. And so most people that are blaming 
the industry or uh, specific instructors for charging too much really just don't want to take responsibility for their own life. And I, and I feel kind of bad of ending this on such a hard note like that. But people, success in life is about extreme ownership. You either take responsibility for your success, whether it's financially or personally or socially or whatever else, or you don't. And like Jeremy, like you just said, you know, martial arts is that path. That is the path towards not only extreme ownership, but success, personally, socially, spiritually. <laughs> and you apply those skills in the uh, business world, also financially. So it's just such an important topic. And, and I'm really happy that you brought me on to, to talk with you about this today. Awesome. Well, I, I thank you for being here. And I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing so openly and, and being willing to have a conversation about the, the bigger subject and not simply, as you said, pimp your business. But if people want to find you, social media, websites, et cetera, where would they go? Yeah, guys, just uh, listen. If you are a professional martial arts teacher, right? Can you define um, that? You've used that term. I, yeah. I just asked you earlier. So if you are a school owner, if you were a school owner and you just couldn't make things work or something happened, right? Um, if you are a head instructor, an assistant instructor, um, if you're doing seminars, professional in anything defined is somebody who gets paid for something. We can't help the 26-year-old fighter, right? We can't help the, the, the martial artist. But if you have already been paid or have made a go at being paid as a martial arts teacher, that's a whole nother ball of wax. And therefore, because you have attempted to become, become compensated for your guidance for your mentorship or your instruction, that's what defines you as a professional. So if you are a professional martial artist, uh, uh, martial arts instructor, martial arts teacher, and you want to learn how to add five to 10 high paying private students, uh, high paying group students, or even high, uh, uh, high value uh, large group students for a school to your martial arts business every month, you can just go to wayofthewarrior.org we actually have a, uh, a free masterclass that totally free, you just register for it. And I actually go through a lot of what we're talking about today, but I take it one step farther because we have the time to do it in that. And I actually show you how to frame, how to articulate it. I go through the three levels of martial arts again. Uh, so you understand, give you examples. We have like five different case studies in there. So you really uh, become educated on the difference between the three different levels and how you're handicapping yourself if you're still at one level one and two. And then there's even a, um, uh, uh, how, how, how to, fr again, how to frame and articulate your marketing. There's like a, a, an advertising workshop in there. There's a sales workshop in there in that same free masterclass where I show you how to talk about transformational outcomes as opposed to just tactical knowledge or even an experience and what's the value in that. So if you're interested in that, you're a professional martial artist, just go on over to wayofthewarrior.org and register for the free masterclass. And uh, if that resonates with you and at the end of the masterclass and you want to talk to us about um, uh, literally planning this out for your business, we're happy to help. We are here to serve the industry and there's a link uh, at the end there, but wayofthewarrior.org gets the, gets the ball rolling. Awesome. What a great discussion. I want to thank Professor Pizzo for coming on the show. And yes, don't worry, folks, we are already in conversation about bringing him back for a full interview because I want to know more about how he got to where he is today. Of course, if you want to find everything we've talked about today, show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've got links. We've got a bunch of stuff. So check that out. And I'd love to hear what you think. Did you agree? Did you disagree? Leave some commentary. Episode 401, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you want to write to me privately, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media at Whistlekick on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. I want to thank you for tuning in. Thank you for all that you do to help and support this company, this show, and the martial arts in general. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. What? Yeah.